the demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already uh, for the last 25 years. Actually, it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp. Can you describe how a concept is formulated, turned into propaganda, and then ends up on someone's bumper sticker or in a newspaper? What's the step-by-step -step process? The other thing is, how close is the Politburo to the actual propaganda creating process? Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the 007 incident was uh, notable in the fact that it took a long time before the Soviets responded to it. And then the military took the lead in terms of explaining what had happened rather than the uh, political organs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know why that actually happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the propaganda concepts are not being developed. They, they had been developed long time ago. There's nothing basically new in the concept of, of overall propaganda uh, methods and goals. The ultimate goal however ridiculous it may sound, or primitive or simplistic, is the world domination. Many, uh, uh, many experts in foreign policy would ridicule my opinion, but this is what it is. I saw it with my own eyes. I was a part of that. So, and my father was, I think I mentioned that before, he was an inspector of land forces. He traveled all over the world where the Soviet troops were stationed, so he knows perfectly well that the troops are not stationed there to collect harvest for Cubans or, or to help Afghanis to, to uh, develop the, uh, for the hordes of cattle or goats. They are there for one purpose, world domination. The concepts, the immediate issues or problems are created, of course, for propaganda purposes, and they end up at, as a bumper s stickers, probably, not uh, long, uh, it takes really short period of time. Unlike some other things in, in the Soviet system, uh, propaganda takes, propaganda is one of the things that they don't save money on. And um, there is a, a huge apparatus of propaganda experts in USSR. Novosti Press Agency is just one of them, one of the organizations. But apart from them, that there is a Department of Agitation and Propaganda with this, within the Central Committee. There are faceless people, names of whom you will never learn. Uh, they are kind of classified. Uh, I didn't explain you the methods today because it will take us another day. The methods include such things as semantic manipulation. The words and expressions are being coined at the rate of five expressions a minute by extremely clever, educated experts. And the media outside of USSR obediently repeats this cliché. I give you just several examples, not, not to take your time, not to bore you to death. Okay, I mentioned one thing, United Nations. The expression was invented by the Soviet propaganda experts, not by Americans. We know perfectly well it's not united and it has nothing to do with nations. More than half of the delegations in the UN do not represent any nation at all. Uh, they are disunited, obviously. Uh, the United Nations had not been able to solve a single military conflict. Nowhere in the world. Uh, they provoked war, yes. They took part in wars. But they didn't prevent expansion of communism or, or they did not prevent a single war anywhere. So the true expression, the true term for United Nations could be disunited bureaucracies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another cliche which was coined in Moscow by experts of propaganda. National Liberation Movement. It's not national because most of the leaders 
do, do not necessarily belong to the ethnic group which they lead, number one. Number two, they are unpatriotic and unnationalistic because they, they obey orders from a foreign country, USSR. Okay? They are trained in USSR, they are paid by the Soviet system, and they, they work in the interests of the Soviet system. Liberation. Whom they are liberating? Who is being liberated? And movement. Movement, we understand, there's something which moves, unlike uh, something which is static. National liberation does not move. It's a war. If, if, you, if you call war a movement, probably. But it, it has nothing to do with uh, the concept of movement in, in American terminology. It means a legitimate, overt, organized, voluntary uh, movement. Right? I presume your, your church or your organization is voluntary. Nobody keeps you here by force. Okay, National Liberation Movement is an army of bandits, professional bandits, which are kept, kept in, within the framework of the movement by force. If they betray, it's like in mafia, they are going to be executed. Okay, another example <coughs> of semantic manipulation is, uh, mm, okay, mm, free medical aid, for example. You think it's it's an American democratic expression? No way. The, this the, the term was coined by by the communists long time ago at the time of Comintern. There's nothing free in this world. Everybody knows it. Least of all medical aid. It's very expensive thing to render medical assistance to other people. To somebody, sometime, somewhere has to pay for it. Who? Taxpayer. Hmm? Obviously. There are many other things that are being coined by, by the Soviet propaganda apparatus. Unfortunately, see, if, if I call myself a genius, a genius writer, for example, Los Angeles Times would not call me that, right? They will call me a strange, crazy Russian who calls himself a genius. Then why the hell they call liberation movements uh, liber what, what, what they call themselves? Just because they are many? The logic is twisted. Um, the stickers on, on, on the bumpers, I don't know. It, it, it depends on the uh, ability of local forces to, to uh, tow up the, uh, tow the foreign policy. How close is Politburo to, to implementation of propaganda actions? Very distant. See, Politburo is a group of self-imposed dictators. They don't really decide anything. The only uh, objective of their existence and their life and their struggle is to stay in power. Unlike American politician who has two objectives. First, to be elected, and second, to be re-elected. <laughs> the, so the, so the Soviet politician doesn't have the first objective. He does not have to be elected. He just makes his way in the party structure all the way up. The election doesn't bother him at all. So the only purpose of his life is to stay where he is and don't rock the boat. They don't make decisions. The decision-making level are the faceless group of experts, as I, as I tried to explain to you. And they, the, the Politburo gives only the basic directions, what to be done, and the obedient servants of the highest caliber, intellectuals, are dutifully developing these things. Um, some independently thinking progressive academics in the United States think that come socialism they will be able to preserve their integrity and independence. It's wishful thinking. They will become obedient servants of the system that they are trying to force upon you. Uh, the Korean airliner incident, from my viewpoint, is not an incident at all. I believe it's, it's, a, it's a carefully planned and premeditated provocation. I'm not sure whether they did it, they killed two, 268 people just to get rid of Larry McDonald, but it, it's feasible. I wouldn't be surprised if they killed uh, more than 60 millions of their own men just to implement rotten ideas of, of Marx and Engels. You know, what, what, what would 268 people matter? Uh, 
Uh, second, it, it is not a military blunder, and, and it, the order was not given by military. Never a single military officer of the highest caliber will take responsibility to shoot a civilian airliner. My father was an officer of general staff of the Soviet Army. I know perfectly well what I'm talking about. No officer would take responsibility. He'll be shot tomorrow. Are you kidding? It's, the order was given by a civilian, by party apparatchik of the highest caliber, and I wouldn't be surprised it was Andropov. In any case, Andropov knew perfectly well what goes on, what, goes on, what went on. The Soviet power structure resembles a triangle, unlike a love triangle in, in real life drama. It's a hate triangle. The, the seats of power are <coughs> party, Communist Party. The elite, of course, not the rank and file party, but the top of the pyramid. The KGB and the military. They hate each other, and each of them hate the other two. The, the, mo the most powerful is the party. This is the real power. The army and the KGB supposedly are servants of the party and the tools, the instruments of their power. But in fact, sometimes they are the power themselves. Andropov belongs to the most hated triangle, the KGB. My father hated KGB because he was military. Both of them, KGB and military, hate the party. Why? Because unlike in the United States, the party is the most adventuristic people. They want to invade countries. They give the orders for all kinds of adventures outside of USSR borders. They know perfectly well that comes war, they will go to bunkers and eat caviar and enjoy life, whereby military will burn in flames of nuclear war. Marshal Grechko was against invasion into Czechoslovakia because he knew that he will have to demoralize his army. And the first two divisions, after facing the reality and seeing that Czechoslovakia is not being invaded by Americans, will get corrupted. So you have to replace them with other two divisions. And if you stay long enough, you will corrupt the whole Soviet army. He said, no, don't invade Czechoslovakia. But Comrade Brezhnev who the hell they are? They think they, they deserve more sausages and butter. So show them thanks. So he did. He obeyed. Uh, the, 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 KGB, the, the KGB and the army sometimes are in cahoots against the party. The recent rumor that Andropov was shot by son of Brezhnev is an indication that the, the other two corners of the power structure were really sick and tired of, of the of the Andropov's KGB purges. You know, there were purges. They, they, many people lost their jobs and some were arrested and some committed suicide in the span of some 10, uh, uh, ten months since Andropov was sentenced to power. So that gives you an idea of well, the Korean airliner incident is premeditated provocation to create an international tension because the only power on earth which is interested in provoking conflicts and preserving tension is the Soviet junta. That's the only justification of them being in power. If there is no enemy outside, they have to create him. If there is no war, they have to provoke it to scare the hell out, out of taxpayers inside and to keep themselves in power. There are so many theories. Uh, one of them is expressed by, I wouldn't say a friend of mine, but I know him. There's, there's another defector, Nikolai Khochlov, who defected long time before I even joined KGB. Uh, he was also a KGB in, in Western Europe. Now he is, teaches psychology in, in one of California universities. He thinks that the Soviet Union developed an ESP, would you believe it, system of influencing the perception and minds of people. And the, the generators of ESP willpower can be focused on individuals and groups of individuals so efficiently that you can literally focus that beam or whatever it is on a pilot or two pilots or three pilots and convince them that actually they are flying on the safe territory so there is no need. They, you can convince them that there is no need to to contact the, the, the ground base station. And you can artificially draw the plane by brainwave into the Soviet airspace. Whether it is true or not, I don't know. 
But I know one thing, that when I was a student and I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute, one of my friends, he was an extremely intelligent Jewish boy, he graduated from the mathematical uh, department of Moscow State University. After three years, I returned from India for, for vacation, and I met him in the, uh, on, uh, during the reception at the Academy of Science. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm working in a secret research bureau. You know, the secret, which means basically defense uh, industry. They don't have addresses, they have post box numbers. And I say, it's not, is it that much secret that you cannot tell me what you research? He said, you wouldn't believe me? Brain waves. And I never saw him again. <laughs> ESP, which officially in the Soviet media is uh, described as a pseudoscience and decadent capitalist gimmick to sidetrack the minds of proletariat from the real issues of class struggle. But obviously KGB takes seriously that uh, pseudoscience. I was born in a military family. My father was a high-ranking officer of the Soviet Army General Staff, uh, inspector of land forces, uh, stationed outside of USSR in every quote-unquote brotherly country or liberated country of the world. Uh, I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute, affiliated to Moscow State University in 1963. I started working with Novosti Press Agency, the biggest propaganda and ideological subversion organization of USSR, which is directly under KGB. Ostensibly, it's a, it's a public news agency. Novosti in Russian language means news, but there are no news. It's mainly propaganda. Uh, my first job was a translator with Economical Aid Group in India. We were building refineries and, and other industrial projects in public sector, socialist sector of India. My last job was press officer of the Soviet Embassy in New Delhi. I defected in 1970, uh, came, landed in Canada, worked for several years as a producer of um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, overseas service in, in Russian language, similar to Voice of America. Then I was teaching at uh, University of Toronto Political Science Department uh, McGill University Slavic Studies and School of Journalism Ottawa in uh, Carlton University in Ottawa. Uh, last year I uh, joined a small Russian language publishing house here in Los Angeles and now I'm a political analyst for weekly Panorama newspaper. Uh, Lumumba University language instruction was my so-called extracurricular activity, uh, which is usually given to Soviet young communists as a non-paid job to prove loyalty to the party. I was instructing students from Asia, Latin America and Africa before they entered at an ideological indoctrination uh, uh, class. Uh, it was mainly uh, Russian language instruction after which the students usually join two-year or three-year extensive course in Marxist-Leninist ideo ideological indoctrination, plus their own sub uh, subjects of, of their choice, uh, medicine, physics, uh, chemistry, whatever. Uh, if, they, if after uh, five or six years studying, they, they are pr proven to be, well, flexible, loyal, uh, cynical enough to follow the Soviet foreign policy, they are being transferred to a KGB school for, t for, the, uh, for a period of two years, after which they are being dispatched back to their native countries and become so-called sleepers, uh, uh, the word from, originated from sleeping. For several years they sleep in their own countries doing nothing. Sometimes they are pursuing their own careers, become lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, um, taxi drivers, barbers. And they spring into action after many years of destabilization of their own countries as Soviet agents. Therefore, all of a sudden you discover uh, well-established lawyers in, in a country like Nicaragua, who are, for some strange reason are 
bitterly against quote-unquote American imperialism and idealistically for Soviet uh, Marxist-Leninist imperialism. Uh, I joined Novosti Press Agency uh, before I graduated from the Oriental Studies Institute where I studied Hindi and Urdu, two languages of Indian subcontinent. Urdu is the language of Pakistan and Hindi is the language of India. The journalistic part of my training was ordinary journalism, mass media, uh, uh, communication theories and, and studies. Together with that, we had a very extensive training in uh, military, civil defense, intelligence, and ideological subversion. So even before I graduated, I started working with Novosti Press Agency, first as a translator, interpreter, and guide with foreign delegations who were invited to USSR and who were shown all the beauties of socialism and dispatched back to their countries to explain to, uh, to their uh, uh, people how beautiful is socialism. Uh, my role was directly linked with KGB activities of, of brainwashing and psychological assessment of these guests. If they showed any sign of flexibility, which means uh, they showed that they were recruitable, uh, I passed them over to professional KGB recruiters and from there on they were actively being involved in ideological subversion and propaganda, both in USSR and in their own countries. Well, the decision, of, of course, was very painful and, and difficult. But on the other hand, I didn't have any illusions or allusions about the Soviet system and, and communist or socialist system. It's the most rotten and unworking system in the world. Uh, some people call it state capitalism, socialism, centralized planning, whatever. It doesn't really matter what kind of name you attach to the system. Basically, if you are a religious person, it's a devilish satan satanistic system which appeals only to the most primitive, negative side of human nature. Uh, it, the, the basis of that system is denial of private property, human dignity, and, and personal responsibility, and of course any religion, uh, religious affiliation of a human being to God as a supreme being. Uh, my dissatisfaction, disillusionment, if you, if you can call it, because I never was illusioned, uh, 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 with, this, with the communism, started as early as um, age from age six, I guess. Uh, the first shock uh, was after the Second World War, uh, when most of the children of my age understood that United States is the friend uh, with whom together uh, Soviet people defeated Nazism, German fascism. All of a sudden, turned into an enemy uh, and all of a sudden the propaganda turned 180 degrees around and we were brainwashed in the spirit of hatred to everything which is American. But how could you explain to a child of six years old who owes his survival to American spam condensed milk, egg powder and things which you probably people never remember because nobody eats them these days, spam meat, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> How can you explain to them that these delicious things came from an enemy who wants to subvert and destroy us? It's impossible because the child remembers when he was hungry he was eating spam and, and drinking condensed American uh, milk with the American eagle on the, on the label. So, all the efforts of the Soviet propaganda to convince me that America is bad was futile, naturally. That was the first shock. The second was this 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party when Khrushchev revealed the atrocities of Stalin terrorism and um, murder, systematic murder of millions of innocent people. That was another greatest shock. Uh, and the third shock, of course, when I was already grown up, uh, a student, invasion into Czechoslovakia in 1968, that was the last point. Uh, and when I was in India, acting as a Soviet uh, official, a Soviet diplomat, I understood that sooner or later I have to defect and to explain what exactly I was doing in India. I fell in love with that country because um, at that time this country didn't do any harm to any neighbors, least of all to the Soviet Union. And yet we did so much harm to that country that I decided to defect and explain it, first to Indians, then to American 
politicians, intelligence communities and media. Unfortunately, I didn't have much success because my stories were treated with a great skepticism. I was called paranoid, McCarthyist, fascist, Cold War maniac and other names which I don't want to mention here. And um, it took me quite a number of years to understand that I'm talking to people who are trying to prevent average American from knowing the truth about communism. The basic methods are not that much different from activities of any public relation officer from any big company, say Coca-Cola, I bet. They have their own department of, person, of public relations and press relations. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose is different. If Coca-Cola wants to make profit and to sell more Coca-Cola to nations of the world, the Soviet Union, the ultimate purpose of the Soviet system is not to sell anything, least of all ideology, is to destroy the civilization on which uh, the affluence and freedom based and replace it with a system of total control over life of human beings the system of total exploitation that's the, the ultimate purpose Can, uh, my specific measures which, which I was forced to do unwillingly of course but I had to do them just to promote myself further and further is uh, bribery, corruption uh, befriending politicians, members of parliament influential uh, scholars uh, members of civil service, businessmen. In other words, anyone who has any um, anything to do with shaping of public opinion in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. Uh, that would include a long process which sometimes is unnoticeable to an average person. It's a long-term process which is called so, uh, uh, ideological subversion. It's unnoticeable as movement of a small hand of a clock. You know it's going around, but even if you watch it in intensely, you, you don't see the movement. The eventual result is uh, befriending these people and trying to get them involved in, in the activity in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. The immediate impulse when I learned that the Soviet Embassy, Department of Research and Counter Propaganda, of which I was a deputy chief, is engaged neither in research nor in counter propaganda. It is a department which is compiling information of private nature on individuals divided in two groups, good boys and bad boys. The sympathetic people were promoted in media and, and public life. Uh, the people who were opposed to the Soviet foreign policy were blackwashed, blackmailed, and, and, and destroyed, first morally and, and sometimes physically too. Uh, understanding of what I was doing came to me when I, when I looked through a press release of United States Information Service describing an incident in a South Vietnamese city of Hue, captured by communists from Hanoi for, for 48 hours. Then it was recaptured by United States and South, South Vietnamese armies. And to their horror, they discovered that within two nights, the communists could manage to round up more than 15,000 people and execute them. Uh, most of these people were either sympathetic to United States or to the Western culture, or directly involved uh, in, in activities uh, uh, supporting United States president in South Vietnam, agents of CIA naturally, even barbers because they know too much. They were executed and United States intelligence couldn't figure out how could they possibly do it in such short period of time. Later on they discovered, uh, they found out from several defectors that long before communists occupied that city uh, there was an extensive omnipresent network of informers who knew exactly the addresses, the names, the whereabouts of each individual who was later executed. When I turned to my own files, I discovered that basically that information exists in my department. So it doesn't take much intelligence to understand what I was doing in India. I was compiling information. Comes revolution, these people would be executed. Indirectly, I was involved in, in, a, in a criminal activity, in, in mass murder. I decided to defect and explain it to Americans, and the uh, response I already described. I was called a paranoid. But I decided to defect and try nevertheless. 
There's another long story. It's virtually impossible to defect in India simply because Indian government, under pressure from the Soviet government, if you can call them government, I don't call them government, I call them junta. Uh, they adopted a law as early as, as, as in 61 or 62, after, after Stalin's daughter defection especially. That law states that no embassy, no, no foreign uh, uh, legation on the territory of Indian Republic has the right to extend political asylum to any defector from any country, which is very, it's, it's a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but a Soviet one needs a political asylum. Uh, if you are a Canadian or American, if you want to be nasty to your own government, the maximum you can do is just to pick up a phone and uh, make a dirty phone call to your ambassador. <laughs> Buy yourself a ticket and get lost. <laughs> what, what happens to a Soviet defector in, under that law? If I knock a door of, of United States Embassy, by that law, the American diplomats have to turn me back to the Indian police and Indian police takes me back directly back to the Soviet embassy. And that's the end of, of my uh, defection. So knowing that perfectly well and having contacts both with Indian police and American uh, media corps, I, I understood that the only way for me was to disappear for a while. And the best way I discovered was to mix with a group of hippies. Mind you, that, <laughs> that was the time <laughs> I, I was 13 years younger, so I looked slightly different, of course. <laughs> I, I studied so-called counterculture in India. Uh, sometimes uh, good, sincere young people who wanted to study Oriental mysticism and culture and religion but most of them were simply easygoing individuals who were delighted with exotic, exotic life and, and um, the easiness with which they can purchase hashish and, and other drugs in India. And sometimes they traveled Indian subcontinent without any identification papers. So the best way to, to uh, escape detection was to mix with the group of hippies and travel in India uh, until the campaign in the media and, and in the police, uh, the police search will subside. All the newspapers in India carried my picture and uh, announcement of the police uh, that anyone coming forward with information about my whereabouts would receive 5,000 or 2,000 rupees. Knowing that perfectly well, I just walked in there barefoot with beads and blue jeans, smoking hush and um, enjoying life until I found sympathetic journalists who smuggled me from India to Greece. Mind you, that was a military dictatorship at that time. Then only I approached uh, American CIA and they helped me to uh, land in Canada as a legit uh, ordinary uh, immigrant. So now I'm a Canadian citizen. As you can see from my patriotic type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Canada is a kind of middle of the, way, uh, of the road country where uh, there are so many various ethnic groups that another uh, strange character who speaks both Russian and, and English and two oriental languages, did, did, I, I, I didn't have any um, problem uh, fitting into academic circles and first being just a student at the University of Toronto and later a producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I think it was successful, and until and unless the, there will be follow-up to that uh, movie, uh, it will remain as as a as an open wound in in the United States as a scare tactic. Uh, which in this particular case, I'm not sure whether KGB paid for production of that movie or not. But it's totally irrelevant. What is the most important, unless after seeing the tragic sequences of, of the uh, uh, nuclear attack, uh, American population is not explained what to do about it. If you still stop at that and l let it be, obviously, th this is the scare tactic, this is the greatest harm done to United States by, by Americans, by American filmmaker. I bet Andropov and all his disinformation uh, system could not, could not possibly do that much harm to the United States. When, when you see something obviously sponsored by the Soviets, uh, you understand, well, this is propaganda. You may or may not agree with this, depending on your 
background and, uh, and, and intelligence and education. But here it's a subtle approach, uh, playing on the most sensitive strings of your soul, appealing to, to the most basic instincts of, of, of human nature, survival. But there, there are no answers. How to survive? Well, obviously, disarmament is not the answer. Uh, simply because some people naively expect Andropov to blush uh, out of shame and reduce the number of warheads. Uh, it doesn't happen this way. This, we are facing unresponsive, irresponsible group of people for whom uh, nuclear war is not a theory, it's a practice. And the, the military strategy of the Soviet Union is designed to to do nuclear war and to survive and possibly to win. I, I, was, I started my military training when I was six or seven years old, when I, when I entered secondary school. And I graduated in 63 after almost 15 years of continuous training as a junior lieutenant of reserve of the Soviet Army. And uh, psychologically, every Soviet citizen is well prepared for, for, for war, nuclear war. And uh, technically, he is equipped with facilities and the knowledge how to use it in case of war or, or natural disaster. It doesn't matter. Survival tactics and survival um, methods are taught extensively. In, in various manners, they, they, they are exposed to documentary movies about nuclear war. They know the, the technical data of, of radiation or, or contamination of, of air and, and land. They know the organizational patterns of, of civil defense to such an extent that even if there is no nuclear attack, even if there is conventional uh, warfare, each individual at, at a certain time knows exactly where to go, what to do, where is the shelter, uh, whom to call by telephone, uh, which is not the case, unfortunately, in the United States. I think if, if a bomb, ordinary bomb, bomb, maybe a sting bomb is dropped in the middle of Los Angeles, most of the people will not die of uh, atomic radiation, they will die of panic, they will, they will run. And, uh, the traffic jams and, 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 and the Panic will kill more people than, than any, anything else. And where do they go? Is, is, is there any literature about how to protect an individual? Is the medical first aid treatment? It's not taught to, to, to kids in the American colleges, unfortunately. For example, there's obvious uh, tension in the world. Uh, t television newscasts. Um, inform American family about happenings in, in uh, East and West Germany. And only at the last moment they decide to bring the canned food down to the basement. <laughs> it's a sheer idiocy. Why not to have them in the basement at, the, at peacetime? Uh, number two, there's, there's a very realistic picture of what happens uh, when the first nuclear bomb strikes uh, a big city, Kansas City, I think. And people still, uh, a, a big panoramic uh, picture shows almost an ant hill when you know people are disoriented totally. That would produce laugh in Russia because unlike that, Soviets know exactly what to do. There will well, be much less panic, if, if, if at all. Uh, I, I know about infiltration of KGB into peace movement probably as much as an average. Uh, American who reads newspapers uh, systematically. But uh, I'm obviously, I, I'm aware that the World Peace Council is, is a front organization of, of the KGB. Ramesh Chandra, I know personally, both in India and USSR. I work, worked with delegations of, of um, various peaceniks who came to the World Congress of, 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 of Peace Council in Moscow. I think it was in 1961 or 62. Yeah, it was before Cuban crisis. And uh, at that time, they struck me as, as people who are pathologically unable to see the truth, uh, not to talk about the, the military aspects. When, I, when as a translator and, and a guide, I used to take them to places in Moscow which are not supposed to be for foreigners' eyes. 
uh, they didn't want to see it. Uh, they had their preconceived ideas. They, they were suffering fr from self-importance. They thought it's, it's a great honor to sit in the Kremlin, in the palace of, of Congresses, next to, a, next to a debil from Kremlin, and uh, you know, talk about peace as if uh, that person from Politburo means anything in, in peace movement. Self-delusion is, is the most predominant phenomenon among these people. Ramesh Chandra is, is a very shrewd politician who takes advantage of naive, misguided, idealistically minded, sometimes sincere people. Uh, but he is, I, I, I would, my impression is that he's totally sold himself to the Soviets. He receives his payments or royalties or whatever you can call it in the form of prizes. Of course, it's very embarrassing if you, if, you, if you approach a person of his caliber with money, with cash, and say, here, Comrade Ramesh Chandra, there is money for your propaganda uh, in the interests of the Soviet Union. It's very impolite. So instead, the Soviet Union creates artificial international bodies, such as Jabaharlal Nehru Peace Committee, which consists of various progressive leaders, writers, uh, sometimes they're the known figures and uh, philosophers, educationists. Uh, sometimes they probably feel that if there's no other possibility to express the de desire for peace, at least there is some legitimate overt activity where they can express themselves. That's okay. And they think they are too smart not to see that uh, part of it is Soviet propaganda. Think, okay, we are smart. We are not going to allow them to use us for propaganda purposes. This is wishful thinking, because after five or six visits, visits to USSR, everything is paid by the Soviet uh, government. After spending several vacations on a Black Sea coast, in luxurious atmosphere with two or three nice girls, interpreters, lots of vodka and caviar, books published, Rapid books, which nobody reads in the United States, all of a sudden published in millions of copies in the USSR in various languages that tickles their ego. They think they are some, somebody's all of a sudden. It's difficult to resist the temptation. Ramesh Chandra is exactly that type of personality. He was approached at, at, at a very early stage, uh, and uh, uh, he didn't have willpower and moral principles to resist the temptation, to resist the approach. And by now he's, he's just a pawn in the game, high-ranking pawn. And um, uh, if he is dis dismissed or dies natural death, there will be another the, the line of people who would like to take his place. Yes, KGB takes very active part in the, in the peace movement. Uh, and if these people were sincere as they say they are, they would start demonstrating in Kremlin, or I mean in Red Square, not in Washington DC or in, in, in the Central Park in New York or in Los Angeles. But they don't have courage, they don't have guts to go to Russia and protest against the nuclear armament of the Soviet Union. Therefore, I agree that they are misguided, but I think they are cowards. They are unprincipled, dishonest people. And there's no justification that they are misguided or poorly informed. It's their fault that they're poorly informed. There's enough information, there's enough possibility. In case of United States citizens, there's enough freedom to do what their consciousness should tell them to do. Go to Russia and protest against armament. It doesn't take much courage to, 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 to take part in demonstration in Los Angeles. But if you're really genuinely concerned about peace, tell it to Brezhnev, tell it to Andropov. And we'll see how courage courageous and sincere you are. They don't do it. Well, the greatest strength, I think, is, is uh, uh, the, the basic principle of American democracy, common sense, and the, uh, the value of, of of the principles of private property and, and, and respect to human dignity and, and indivi individual rights. The weakness is the permissiveness and lack of moral stamina, which if you are 
a religious person could be could be interpreted as probably alienation from religion, alienation from God. Thinking too much in materialistic terms, thinking in short span of time for pragmatic advantages, disregarding the perspective of civilization. Some philosopher, I forget his name, I'm, I was a bad student in Moscow, said that the level of civilization is in direct proportion to the time span that human being thinks in, in future, for future. The least civilized people live today, this minute. The more civilized nations think about tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Well, this is one of the definitions of... Unfortunately, Americans are made to think in shorter and shorter time span terms. This is the greatest weakness. So therefore, enjoy life and make love, not war. I, I think that willpower and revitalization of traditional moral values and principles is the most desirable thing now, today, the, the sooner the better. The things that the principles and values on which the affluence and success of American civilization depends and, and based upon should be immediately civil, uh, uh, revitalized and brought back to school programs, to media, and let's face it, propaganda. I'm not afraid of this word, unlike the uh, left liberal journalists who think, oh, well, it's propaganda. I don't see anything wrong in propagating the basic moral principles and values on which America is built. Willpower, faith, unshakable faith that this country, this civilization is right and the enemy is wrong. No amount or no number of nuclear warheads and, and no size of the army will, will help United States to survive, whether there is nuclear war or conventional warfare. Vietnam proved very clearly that with all the technology, with all the supersonic bombers and napalm and whatnot, electronic gadgets and, and cold beer and Coca-Cola, you cannot defeat an enemy unless you are fighting and have faith in the righteousness of your fight. So that's the most urgent thing, I think. Wake up and, and, and convince yourself that you are on the right side. There should not be no neutralism or object objectivity. Or objectivity is good when you are discussing philosophical concepts. In today's world, if you are neutral, you are already an enemy of your own country. You have to actively take part of your country, your side. One of the reasons of my defection is that I took side. I was, I was decided to take part, to take choice, to make my own personal choice. For some strange reason today, it's very fashionable, it's considered to be an intellectual chic, not to take sides. Academic media, mass, uh, uh, academic circles, uh, Hollywood stars, uh, politicians, they think it's very fashionable, it's intellectual to be non-allied, non-committed, uh, neutral. It's, it's, it's not intellectual, it's suicidical. <laughs> Suicidal. <Sorry. laughs>